Bonsoir. Euh, C'est formidable de voir autant de personnes ici ce soir pour cette importante conversation. Thank you to all of you for coming this evening uh, to be part of this very important conversation. As I look around the room, I see so many leaders, so many interested individuals, so many people who have lived experience, and so many people here to learn. We're gathered here today uh, in this place on traditional lands. These are the traditional and sacred lands of the Anishinaabek, the Ininawak, Anishinawak, Dakota Oyate, and Dene Sulene. And we are here on Treaty 1 territory. This is, of course, the homeland of the Red River Métis and home to many people from the Inuit Nunangat who have made their home here. I'd like to also acknowledge that the water um, that we drink here in Winnipeg, that's in the glasses that you may find yourself uh, looking for later today, comes from Shoal Lake and give gratitude to the First Nations that have cared for that water for thousands of years. Je tiens aussi à reconnaître que l'eau de Winnipeg que nous buvons et utilisons tous les jours provient du lac Shoal sur le territoire du traité numéro 3. Merci aux nombreuses générations de personnes des Premières Nations qui vivent sur ce territoire et qui en ont pris soin. So, right here, these lands. Uh, I'm thinking today, as many of us are, about Amanda Clearwater and her three children and her cousin, who we heard about in the news today, uh, who were murdered near Carmen, Manitoba. I'm thinking about just about 100 feet from here, out those doors over there is Camp Mercedes, where the family of Mercedes Myron has been caring for a sacred fire for 208 days as they await the completion of the search of the landfill to find the remains of their loved one. I'm thinking about 1.2 kilometers or so from here are the Alexander Docks, where the body of 15-year-old Tina Fontaine was found in 2014 and where we often gather to think about women and girls, two-spirit and gender diverse people who've been murdered or missing. I'm thinking about 26 kilometers or so that way, Stony Mountain Institution opened in 1877, the oldest running federal penitentiary in Canada, which at any time might have 800 or so people incarcerated across minimum, medium, and maximum security units. Thinking about three kilometers from over here, Eagle Women's Lodge, where 30 or so women are uh, getting traditionally appropriate uh, and, and learning through in, uh, traditional indigenous ways so they can transition back to the community. And I'm thinking that we're about two kilometers from the Remand Center, where on any given day there are 300 or so men, women, uh, being detained before trial to ensure that they'll show up for court, we will be protected for our safety, or it's otherwise necessary to, to hold them to maintain the confidence in the administration of justice. That's what I'm thinking about as we gather here tonight. Voilà où nous sommes rassemblés à quelques mètres ou kilomètres seulement des lieux qui sont liés directement ou indirectement à notre conversation de ce soir. I'm humbled to be able to share in this conversation we have planned with all of you, and I'm heartened to see so many of you here tonight. We're here with the hope of engaging more people to care for the systems that we've created for each other. Because this system that we'll talk about tonight is a system that we created, and it's a system that we don't talk that much about. Here we are at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. This is where we are working every day towards a vision of creating a world where everyone values human rights and takes responsibility for promoting respect and dignity for all. Our mandate calls on us to explore the, the subject of human rights, particularly in the Canadian context, so we can build greater understanding of human rights and encourage both reflection and dialogue. And so we hope that this program tonight will spur some dialogue in the room, but also dialogue that will 
that as you leave each other tonight or we leave each other, dialogue that will continue in your cars on the way home, to the bus stop as you walk, and through to your kitchen tables and conversations tomorrow. You know, it's almost trite to say that this is an important conversation for us to have. There are so many important conversations for us to have right now. Millions of people, many of them women, children, and the elderly are ravaged by war right now in Gaza, Sudan, Ukraine, Congo, and many other countries around the world. The impacts of the climate crisis are growing and showing themselves every day with acute severity. We're seeing a rise in anti-Semitic attacks across the country, and, and I could go on. There are many important conversations that we need to have right now about the systems of power that enable the violation of our basic human rights as human beings, and if the promotion of our human rights are always the basis for these conversations, we'd like to hope that what you learn this evening, that what we share this evening, will translate and will be the basis for other conversations you might have, other very important conversations. Tonight, we will talk about a system that we need to pay attention to. The penal or correction system in Canada predates the beginnings of this country, actually. It dates back to the earliest days of English and French colonial settlement. And I share with you that in the year before I joined the museum, I had a relatively rare opportunity to learn a little bit about this system. And I'm forever changed because of it. So allow me to just indulge for a second. Um, my job was to help get off the ground a new system that was designed to put the practice of solitary confinement to rest. It was built in response to concerns that the human rights of prisoners were being violated and that we should oversee the implementation of rehabilitative programming uh, and supports to ensure that people in prison could, could, could thrive, could have human contact, could have their human rights respected. And as a human rights lawyer, I had been in a correctional facility only once before that. In the course of that year that I did this work, I visited every federal penitentiary in Western Canada and a couple near in Ontario. I spent hours of every day speaking with people in these units, flagged for my attention because they had not had human contact as required by the law. I listened to their stories. We chatted on the phone. We talked about what was going on, sometimes having everything to do with why they were there and sometimes having nothing to do with it. And I can tell you that I know in that, from that brief glimpse into this system that I know that change is needed. I know that we don't understand the realities of this systems enough, and I know that having these conversations whenever and wherever we can is important if we are going to create the momentum that is needed to ensure that every person is treated humanely and that every person is able to lead a life with dignity and that respects their inherent worth. So that is why we're having this conversation this evening. So with that, I'd like to invite my fellow panelists to please come up to the stage, and I'd like to introduce you to them, and then we're going to start a little bit of a conversation, after which we'll have time for you to be part of that conversation through the questions you pose in Slido, or, um, or that you raise your hand and we'll bring you a mic. So, uh, to my right, I have Elder Robert Green. Elder Green is... Uh, an elder from Iskate Wazagagan, number 39, Independent First Nation, which is also known as Shoal Lake 39. It's an Anishinaabe community out, that's an Anishinaabe uh, community that's located just, just east of the southern Ontario, Manitoba, Ontario border. Um, his spirit name is Nizagobo. Nizogabo. Nizogabo. Miigwech, or Two Standing Man. And he is a residential school survivor a qualified trauma counselor. He spent time at Crane River Healing Lodge and with inmates from Stony Mountain serving life sentences and in other provincial correctional centers sharing traditional teachings and knowledge. Elder Robert is also our elder in residence at the museum and uh, feels really good to have you beside me. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, to my left, yeah. To my left, I've got Tanya Ross from a Pasquia Cree Nation who just rolled in. Yeah, we, okay, who lets someone <laughs> cheer? <laughs> um, you rolled in very, just minutes ago um, and transformed getting out of the car and is now up on stage in, I don't know, oh. right? <laughs> Less than 10 minutes or something. Um, Tanya's here and uh, is going to share much of some of her story. She's going to share her experiences from the two decades she spent in prison after she got involved in gangs at a young age and was convicted of secondary degree murder at the age of 19. Uh, Tanya's also going to talk, and it's going to be very obvious that she is a motivational speaker, and she credits so much of her success uh, to getting, and to getting her life on a good path because of the elders and supports that she received um, during her time. And then, yeah. <laughs> Uh, senator Kim Pate is with us, an independent senator who was appointed in 2016. Uh, she's the, the member of the Standing Senate Committee on Human Rights that studied respect for uh, human rights in the federal correctional system. She spent the last four decades advocating for the rights of men, women, and young people within Canada's penal system. Uh, and she's really got to know some of the women who are going to be with us this evening. And... Uh, doesn't really need much of an introduction, so uh, um, is doing work that, um, that I know that we'll all take a little piece of away this evening. Odelia Cusance is with us on the, on the screen and is going to join us. Odelia, can you hear us okay? I can hear you guys good. It's like you hear me? We can hear yeah, you. And it's like you're just okay. beside us, and it's perfect. Um, Odelia you. is going to, going to talk to us a little bit about her story, um, where she is, what she's experienced, and has been a, an advocate for not only reform, but a new way of looking at our system for a very long time. And I think through this conversation, I'm hoping that what we will do is I'll pose you some questions, and then I think... You'll share what you share, and we'll talk about what we talk about, and there'll be questions, and we'll kind of go from there. So okay. I've got the easy part, I think. Um, so let me find my questions, and we can go from there. So <clears throat> before I turn to my fellow panelists, I would like to um, maybe ask all of you in the room to think about just as you listen for a while, ask yourself why you came here tonight. What brought you here to this conversation? And who will you share this conversation with after you leave tonight? So, Senator Pate, I'm going to start with you. Um, can you call me Kim? I, can, I do like to call you Kim, <laughs> but then I get all formal, so I'll call you Kim. Okay, Kim. You've, uh, you've worked in, this prison, in the prison system uh, advocating for, for 40 years, probably more. Um, it's a system that I guess many of us don't know that much about. And I know we were chatting a little bit about that. It's a system that we created and then is kind of put there and, and we don't care for it the way we do for other systems. You speak often about the system and I guess I'm interested to know when you do, what do you think people sort of latch on to? What are they most interested to hear about or surprised to learn about? Well, maybe I'll talk about even just this morning. We went into Stony Mountain this morning. And when I, I've been taking senators into jail, sometimes people laugh at that because they think senators are going to jail not the way some people thought they might. But, um, <laughs> but the reason I take senators into jail is most senators, members of parliament and judges uh, don't know that in our laws now and in our laws since 1992, they have a right of access to those prisons. And my personal view is, is if you are responsible for administering the law, whether you're a police officer or a correctional officer, a judge, 
a lawyer, defense counsel, crown prosecutor, or whether you're a lawmaker, like a senator or a member of parliament, or a provincial, and provincial applies too, and you don't know what the conditions of confinement are to which people are subject when you're passing those laws, my personal view is you have no business voting. Um, now, obviously that is not the way most people operate because we have all these laws and most of them are passed by people who have no idea what the conditions are. And so when senators come in, even and I am surprised sometimes when they say, as they always do, we had no idea. Most people in the public have a B-grade movie idea of what prisons are like. They don't think about the fact that our prisons are the receptacles, and I use that term purposely because they dehumanize, despite some very good people working in them and trying to change culture. It's now more than 45 years since I first stepped foot in a federal penitentiary and in a youth jail. And to a system, to a prison, uh, they are full of the people that every other system fails. Our child welfare system, our social assistance system, our health system, particularly our mental health system, our, uh, the list goes on and on. And yet we hardly ever question the use of that. We don't recognize and call out that prisons aren't and were never designed to be treatment centers, shelters for homeless people, shelters for battered women. Uh, there were none of those things, and yet we increasingly uh, use them without ever questioning. And a good example is right now we're debating a law that we introduced. It was the amendments that we made to the law that informed the, the position you had, Aisha, when you started with corrections. And when we've been debating that, one of the things people are saying is one of the mechanisms right now, uh, there's a provision in the law that people with health including mental health issues, could be transferred out of the prison to appropriate health facilities. Again, most people, including those working in the system, don't even know that exists. And what we're proposing is to ramp that up and make it work. Some of my colleagues, notably the ones who haven't been in the prisons, I would say, have said things like, well, that would overload our health system. Come into the prison and see how it's overloaded with people with men. If you don't have a mental health issue when you go into prison, there's a pretty fair bet one will be generated the longer you're there. And that's not because there's a whole bunch of bad people, but because we know, we're increasingly knowing the impact, the neurological, the psychological, the physiological impact of deprivation, of liberty, and of sensory deprivation. And that, of course, gets even worse when you talk about isolated conditions by whatever name solitary confinement, segregation, medical observation, structured intervention units. And most people uh, don't you really turn their mind to that. Most people, um, at first blush, if they've never been inside a prison, will think, well, that's where the people go who deserve to be there. And then when they go and they see it's your mother, it's your sister, it's your dad, it's your uncle, it's your child. Uh, and I, when I train, I was working, uh, I still have law students work with me, and, and when I was teaching at the law school, I used to always say, I want you to operate in no matter what job you do, as though you are treating the person who you love most in the world. And if you wouldn't treat them the way that you are encouraged to, told to, directed to, um, then you may be wanting to question why. Why, why can we dehumanize? Why can we treat certain people in a way that doesn't respect them as individuals? Not countenance or, that doesn't mean you say everything they did was okay, but when you care about someone, then how you try to address or correct that behavior is very different than if it's someone who you don't value or you don't think uh, deserves to be loved and cared for. So. Uh, that's probably one of the most surprising is I think most people mm -hmm. don't think about um, how many people in their lives are impacted. I mean, one in 10 Canadians has a criminal record. That means for every one of you here, and if you're Indigenous, if you're racialized, it's more likely more of, of the people you know. If you've grown up in relative economic deprivation or in poverty, it means probably you know more. Um, but every you know, increasingly people talk about mental health and how their families and their, 
um, their lives are touched by it. We need to get to a place where people talk about how this system and the failure of every other system, including this one, touches people's lives and directly impacts because it all, it directly impacts all of us. And I would say mostly in a negative way and not because people intend it that way, but because they often just never turn their mind to it. It makes me think <clears throat> the brief time that I held that position going into the prisons. Uh, I remember when we were being oriented uh, to what it would be like and what the job would be and we would be traveling to prisons across the country uh, doing these, this review work. And we were a room full of human rights, ag advocates, activists, lawyers, whomever, people who, who maybe had some inkling of, of, of how, to, how to do these reviews. And there was so much conversation about our own safety, about what kind of barriers would be between us and the people that we would meet. Should we change our phone numbers? How would we be safe? What would we do? Would we go in? Should we do everything by video? And one visit, to one prison, poof, it all disappeared. And we realized this, I can't believe we were even thinking the way that we were. Um, and I say that with a lot of um, kind of shame that that's, that's what we were thinking about, our own safety. And then we went and met a bunch of people who just needed to talk and who we needed to talk to. Um, well, and, and the reality is this, there are sometimes things that happen that are violent and mm -hmm. sometimes there are risky. But the people going in providing support, you know, I often say, um, consider who benefits from the perspective you're being asked to accept and, and who likely is going to be most impacted. And, you know, I'm, I'm old, it's clear. Uh, when I first started doing this work, it, it was really routine that if there was an incident happened in a prison, um, sometimes I get asked to come in. And because, you know, I'm just going to use you as an yeah, example, Tanya. Okay. If, if Tanya said, you know... You get to follow next, so then yeah, you can so, be like, everything but, she said wasn't true. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, if someone said, I, I don't want to talk to you because I don't trust, you hold the key, you, you might actually put me in seg, whatever, I might get a call and say, would you talk to so-and-so? They're refusing to lock up, or, or worse. You know, I had my baby in a sling at SAS Penn when I went in to negotiate when the women had all refused to lock up. And... You know, when I walked in, um, it, we, it's, you have to consider the risk in the context of not just who's going in, but what their purpose is and what their relationship has been in the past as well. And right now, too often, that risk is a cookie-cutter approach, which is not historic. Well, it, in some cases, it was historically, but it's also one of the challenges is when you, when you go to the lowest common denominator, then mm -hmm. probably you're taking a big hammer to like, you know, mm -hmm. right. flick a hair. And so right. instead of really looking at in what is really required in these contexts. Tanya, I'm gonna ask you kind of a similar question. Um, you speak really openly about your experiences and you speak about them often. Um, I'll let you share whatever you wish about your experiences. But my question to you is this. Given all that you have experienced in your time in prison, what do you think is important for us to know, to hear from you? I'll ask you a whole bunch of other questions too, but just to start us off. Um, so the most important question that I, I often um, humble myself and I go back to, uh, sorry, my voice shakes when I, speak raw and speak the truth um, about my life. So when I was doing my 20 years inside, um, you know, I, I did years and years in segregation. Um, I went years and years without phoning my family because it was too hard. It was too hard for me to talk to my brothers and sisters, my mom, because I knew they were living life out in this world without me. And um, my life was prison. My life. And I truly believed I was going to die in the penitentiary. I had no hope. I had no hope of ever walking in this world. And um, my mom... She prayed for 20 years, 
or she calls them earth angels to get put in my path to help guide me because I was so lost. There's many, many years that I spent Christmas in segregation, in lockup. And those prayers were answered. They really were answered. Lots of elders came in my way, came on my path, guided me. And the one thing that truly saved my life was the unconditional love of elders. They didn't judge me. They just wanted to see me do good. And they knew that I had good in my heart. They knew it. They didn't condone what I did. They would call me on my behaviors. When I was in the pen, I ran the pen. I ran population. I was bad. I was rank. I had no hope. I was still running with the gang life in prison. And then when I changed my life, it was the elders. Sorry. It was um, the elders that, that showed me that love. And I knew it was true. I knew it was true. Because when you grow up in CFS, when you grow up in Young Offender Center, when you grow up in the system, we people, we know who's fake and who's real. We feel it. And the elders were real. And so the biggest thing for me when I was inside was I went to the elders and I started learning and I started digging deep. And it's not, when you go inside, it's not every elder that's going to be a, a true elder. Like straight up, there's a lot of popcorn elders inside. And I know you guys laugh, but there is, you know, they come and they want the white envelopes with the money and they're not there, man. And when I started learning my voice, I'd ask, who'd you get your teachings from? Because this is who I got my teachings from. I got them from Corolla Cunningham, from Willie, from the late Peter O'Cheese. Willie was his scapios. That's who I got my teachings from. And so I learned how to have a strong voice and ask questions. And I wasn't that scared little girl in CFS anymore. And when I learned I had a voice and when I was strong, I was like, I'm a human being. I made mistakes, but I'm a human being. And so when I see my sisters inside and there's still some lifers that I've done time with that are still inside to this day. The biggest thing was the love, the unconditional love of the true elders that helped me. Yeah. It's gonna, it's gonna be a good session. <laughs> We're gonna get raw. <laughs> well, Delia, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you really the, the same question, and this is just to kind of get us all talking a little bit. Um, is there one story, one experience, just something that you think is the most important thing that you want us to know about what life was like what life is like currently in our prison system, from your perspective. Uh, good evening, people. Thank you, Tanya and Kim, for your, your um, words. I just want to express today, I have, a, I have a cold, so don't mind my throat. I'm grateful for, to be here tonight, but pretty much Tanya and Kim said it all in one story. We all have one story. But my uh, story today is that I'm 52 years old and I'm still strong-minded. I never allowed the system to break my spirit because like Tanya was saying, as for myself, my children gave me hope. But before my children gave me hope, the elders gave me hope. You know, I was, I don't know what they call bad. In, in jail. <laughs> and um, the one thing though that really stuck to mind is like, you know what, 
but Kim was saying they're not healing lodges. They're not, you know, institutions for a lot of people nowadays with mental health and a lot of spirituality. You know, that's what we need. There needs to be more. And one thing, our leaders, our community leaders, our chiefs, our counselors, like being in the prison all these 31 years, the only people that actually listen were like Kim herself and other lifers, women. I just did 31 years and finally out, still not free because of racism and a lot of other situations and my sister. You know what I'm gonna say today? Prison ain't rehabilitation. You either make it or you don't. You know, like even after inmates get out, women get out, there is no help. So they go back to using drugs and alcohol. I've been in for the past 31 years and I finally got out and I never knew about addictions, how severe addictions are and how severe women are struggling out there because they get sent to jail. Sometimes they want to go back to jail. But what I'm saying, we need more better leadership. You know, why are so many women and, and still going back to jail? You know, a lot of people make it more out being on the run than being on parole because they do better when they're on the run. But on parole, they try. They want to so try. I, you know, I've been having uh, a difficult time because me and my sister are so badly institutionalized. And I have no shame. Today, my sister is struggling. And I know a lot of other people are struggling today. So, and what really kept me inside were the elders and people like sisters like Tanya, adopt family inside. Even leaders like him has been there since day one, since we had our babies, our daughters, I should say, you know. So this is one I want to show you. This is my Bible in jail, this book, <laughs> the purple one. I always kept this in my top drawer. This is the one Kim, Kim gave me, Human Rights in Action, and then this tells everything, all our rights in prison. But you know what? They break our rights too, because nobody wants to sit in, se sit in segregation. I put a, a class action suit, what a claim, and I laughed because they denied me. They refused my claim. But you guys put me in segregation. Like, you know, you're so quickly, but yet, you know, I could go on and on and on and on today, but I'm still fighting for my freedom, my all my freedom, I'm not giving up today. And I'm not giving up on my sisters that are in prison. That you know, because women don't belong in prison. They don't. Mm -hmm. You know, we're all good people. My one niece died in prison in uh, provincial a year ago. She was a twin. Then we lost my other niece two what, months ago, her twin sister, because she didn't get no justice for her little sister dying in the correctional system yet. So that's where I'm at today. And you know, I, I'm, I'm just sitting at home, rekindling with my family still. You know, it's almost going to be a year, and I'm still not free, free, but I'm grateful I get to be with my children every day. So with that, and I also have so many people to thank, you know, but I'm really grateful to be here for inviting me. Like, you know, there are good people out there, like Kim Pate and Holly Moore, lots of people, and the Caps you know, the chiefs, but, you know, we need our leaderships from our communities to help. Miigwech, thank you for listening. Thanks, Adelia. Thank you. I'm going to come back to you with some other questions, but uh, maybe I'll, I'll ask Elder Robert. Um, Elder Robert, you've worked in the provincial system. You've also worked at a healing lodge. I mean, you're an elder who's worked with many men and women. From your perspective, you've heard some description of 
these experiences, what do you think is important for us to know? Oh. I guess it's very important to know that these systems were created by non-Indigenous peoples in government. And back in the 1800s, we were classified as being the Indian problem. And they created legislation and policies around this problem. The only problem is that we were in the way of development. They needed our lands and our resources. That's what they looked for. In designing, creating, and implementing the, this policy around the Indian problem, that they designed the systems, the criminal justice system, the residential school system, child family services systems, and to me, that this is not our problem as indigenous peoples. It's their problem. It's the government's problem that created this, this situations for, for the containment, for the, uh, <clears throat> to, to house our people, to incarcerate our people, and to, uh, to manage our people because of the of the problem that we that we suppose supposedly to be with the, for the federal government and around this idea of the indian problem that they we posed many obstacles to the to the development of canada to the extraction of natural resources and the taking and, and uh, of our of our lands, that they found a ways to manage and contain and imprison our peoples in the system. Not only did they design the, these systems, but they also have. Uh, what we call the, uh, the, the laws and policies that, that govern our people, and that's the Indian Act. That is a, a form of social engineering of, our, of the indigenous peoples to change our peoples. And through that laws, governing our, our people. The, <clears throat> the system created a way to, to criminalize our way of life. They criminalized our feasts, our dancing, our powwows, our, uh, our potlatches. It was against the law for more, for more than three Indians to stand together in one place. It was against the law to have sweat lodges, pipe ceremonies, naming ceremonies. It was against the law to leave the confines of the reserve without a pass system. You cannot leave the reserve to, to go out hunting to feed your family. So, in that containment and management and control of our peoples, we now have this criminal justice system. That is the reason why there's a high, a high rate of uh, indigenous population within these systems, whether it's men, women, or youth that are confined in these, in these, uh, <coughs> in these jails and prisons. That's what we need to know. And that's what we need to find out more about that. 
<clears throat> and incidentally, the first laws and policies governing the, the Indian problem was created by the Conservative Party. And the Conservatives were never really um, indigenous friendly. When you look at the design and the laws around it, we're still working through, as I worked in, at Milner Ridge, <coughs> that the Conservatives have uh, had a, a legislation called the Minimum uh, Mandatory Sentence. And a lot of our, our, of our young men and women that are in the system, there's a, revol a revolving door. They're let out on parole, and then they come back because there's no system there to support them. And what's been emerging and gaining traction in these systems is that our culture, our language, our way of life, our way of being and seeing and living is helping these individuals these young men find who they are. One of the most common stories that I've heard working with these young men was that it took, it brought me to jail, it brought me to prison to find out who I am, about my culture, about my language, about my traditions, about my way of life. That is what we need to know. We need to know what works and what doesn't work. What works is having elders, like uh, Tanya said, that, that these really true elders that work with, uh, with our people. And while working inside these systems, there was never a time that I, I, I felt threatened when I, when I was inside there. It's not because that uh, there was constant surveillance, monitoring of, of these uh, young men inside. It was because I had respect for them and they had respect for me because they seen me as a brother, as an uncle, a grandfather, somebody that never, never had in their life growing up in the CFS system. That is one of the many things that we need to know. And these are many, one of the difficult conversations that we need to have is that how can we change the laws and the policies governing the, the criminal justice system? What is needed to change? And since <clears throat> I've been working in these systems. We've been gaining more, more friends, more allies to help us to change the system. And that's what we need to know. Thank you. Uh, Kim, I'm, I'm gonna talk about supports a little bit and we can get more into sort of some of the stories, some of the things that work, that didn't work, what it, that we leave with a better understanding of what's what life is like in this system. But before I do, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, we've talked about, um, or you've mentioned to me the, the difference between, from your experience, men and women, how they get there, their experiences, um, and a little bit about, if you can touch on too, what, what you've been able to see in, in your work over that time around elder support and and where it works and what you've heard. Thank you for that, and thank you, Elder, and thank you, Tanya, and thank you, Adelia. Can we freeze that chart for a minute? Is it possible to keep it up for a second? Because I want to, I first want to say, I don't disagree with anything I've heard, but I want us all to think about what an indictment, what an indictment of our country, of our communities it is, that the first time some Indigenous people, First Nations, Inuit and Métis people, have any contact with, their, with elders, 
with their culture is when they go to prison. That has been used to fuel putting more resources into the prison that look positive, and I'm not saying they're not positive, but, but the result is very different than we anticipated. And I'm gonna come back to that chart in a minute, but answer your question first, I should. And the, when I first went to the prison for women, I had been working with women a bit, because I was working with young people and then they got older, but the majority were men. When I first went to the prison for women, I was shocked by what women were in prison for. As I started asking questions about the context, uh, more than half of the women serving federal sentences are in for violent offenses. But when you t peel back just one layer, you see that almost all of them have first been reacting to the violence that was perpetrated against them. Many, many cases, they didn't get the benefit of self-defense or defense of other. I don't use the term Gladue factors for that exact reason. Jamie Gladue never got the benefit. And in fact, the racist, misogynist way her case was treated is emblematic of what I saw when I went to the prison for women. If, are there law, I'm sure there's lawyer, well, there are lawyers and judges and law students amongst you. You know that when you study that case, the facts are Jamie was a 19-year-old jealous wife who stabbed her um, husband because he was having an affair. Jamie was 19, year old, 19 years old, pregnant by her second child with a man who was so abusive that she had been hospitalized and he had been jailed previously. When Reuben moved her to Nanaimo from Calgary, Nanaimo's on Vancouver Island, it moved her to get her away from her support system. Her father, who was a single dad, moved the siblings who were still living at home with him to live beside them. So concerned was he about Jamie's safety. The night that Jamie stabbed Reuben Beaver, he had first beat her up. He'd then gone next door, broken in through the bedroom window, raped her sister, come back, beat her up, and Jamie stabbed him as he was trying to get back in the, the house where her sister was. Now I ask you, what but a racist, misogynist interpretation recharacterizes that as a jealous wife upset her husband is having an affair? That to me epitomizes what so many women have experienced. Their attempts to negotiate poverty, their attempts to negotiate the histories of abuse, the trauma. Uh, many of the women that I've known are themselves residential school survivors, or they're the first or second generation residential school survivors. There, we, we did this report that you can get that's um, linked because we wanted to show what Tanya, Odelia, Renee, so many other um, women have experienced, which is the, the systemic ways in which every system works against them, but then you add on that misogyny or sexism, and you see a whole nother layer. I had never, I had no idea how profound that would be and what we would see women jailed for, seeing women taking responsibility for men, yeah, seeing women, um, you know, helping support folks who had harmed them. And in the 45 years that I've been doing this work, I have met one, one woman, and you will have never heard of her, these women know her, one woman who commit, committed a predatory act of violence that was on her own, not, not co-accused with someone else, usually someone who had first procured her, and that's in 45 years. I can't say the same about men, but I've also met a lot of men who have also been victimized, so I'm not saying there's not streams, but when you have the overlay for women in particular, you see the, the impact. And so we're calling for a review of the cases of not just these 12 women, but these are 12 women I know really well, to look at those systemic issues so you can start to tease back. Because otherwise, the response we keep doing now, which is keep adding on to the system instead of dismantling and putting resources in the community so that Tanya's of this year who are being born, Odelia's of this year who are being born, Renee's of this year, um, are not the first time they really have access to community and culture is in prison. It needs to be in community. 
Now the chart's gone now, but what it shows is, is there any way to put the chart back up? Oh, it's there? Okay, I can't see it, but I, I know what's on it. So, so that chart, and it's actually on page four of this report. A few years ago, I was asked to do a, a session for some judges and, um, and folks about the incarceration rate of Indigenous people, and we had just hit 50% of women serving federal sentences uh, being Indigenous. A horrific situation. And so I was trying to figure out how do I paint this picture in a way that people can understand. And so a couple of people said, well, do a graph, like show. And so we did that. And what we showed was since the mass or the over-incarceration, over-representation, however you want to frame it, of Indigenous people has been an issue of concern in Canada, the numbers have just kept going up. And as we're having this discussion, every, I can guarantee you, every child in the Manitoba Youth Centre, the last time I was there, were all Indigenous. If there's maybe one non-Indigenous, I'd be shocked today. The majority of those in, the, in Headingley and in the Remand Centre, especially when we talk about the women, will be Indigenous or other racialized. And if we're then uh, talking about who's in the federal system, not a big surprise that 50% of the women serving two years or more are Indigenous. So what does the chart show you? Well, it ch shows every intervention that was supposed to remedy this from the Corrections and Conditional Release Act, which introduced Section 81 and 84 to allow people to serve their prison sentences in the community um, and or uh, be paroled to the community. And, it, and then it continues on uh, 718 2E, which was the sentencing provision that said we should use jail with restraint and only when absolutely necessary for public safety. That's what now is referred to as GLADU factors, but they're 718 2E factors. Then we have the, the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in GLADU. Then we have IPLE. Then we have the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Then we have missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls. Then we have attempts to try and repeal some of the mandatory minimums uh, by the government in C5. Then we have the Correctional Investigator reports coming out, Spirit Matters, and then 10 years later, Spirit Still Matters. And what does it show us? Every time we try and inject elders, healing lodges, programs into prisons, in most cases, and there's, ex there's obvious examples where that doesn't happen and that you're hearing about today, but in most cases, they become assimilated into that system. And I would argue they make us all feel better about more Indigenous people being, oh, well, at least they get culture, at least they get programs, at least they get a healing lodge. But look at what that trajectory is doing. If we keep just adding on to the system, then by the time I am either kicked out or retire from the Senate, we will be, I'll be surprised if we're not at 75% of the women in prison are Indigenous. We can't do this. The human, the social, and the financial cost is so great that we have to roll this back and we have to insist those resources go into community to support Tanya when she was a child before she went into the child welfare system. Odelia before she went into the youth system and into residential school. We have to provide those supports and we can, but it takes political will and it takes the politicians being told by people like you, no more in our name, don't do this anymore in our name and pretend it's okay and make yourself feel better because there's a great elder that goes into that prison and there's a, a great person working here at the Healing Lodge. Um, and that, hopefully, that person helps provide support for Tanya, Odelia, Renee. But what about all of the women who, and the men and the young people who don't get access to those supports? And I, I want to shout out that it's, it's every, everybody who's, not, who's been criminalized on this panel at one time was described as one of the most dangerous, violent people, if not in the entire system, in the prison they were in. So I ask you to reconsider those ideas and in whose interest is it that we continue that kind of approach. And so we need to be investing. I was really happy to see the Supreme Court of Canada decision on, um, was it Friday, Thursday? I can't remember, on, um, 
basically saying child welfare services being self-governed by First Nations is a really important step, but we also need to do it in so many other areas. And there are provisions that would allow that to be done now that we need to be insisting on and not accepting that it's a policy not to do that. Um, people serving, Indigenous people serving uh, sentences and who are currently in maximum security, there's nothing in the law that prevents a community from saying, I want to develop a plan and have that person in my community because they're from my community. The policy prevents it, but policy doesn't trump law. It's the other way around. And so we've, I've been talking to lots of communities about saying, you know, get together, go in or come in. We'll go in. You pick one person from your community who you want to sponsor back in your community. Some communities are banding together because they're saying, you know, Kim, you did such a bad thing that we can't have you back, the harm you caused, but a neighboring community may be willing to help provide some supports as you try and build respect and trust and honor up again. To, so there are ways that this can be being done that we could be doing right now, but are being discouraged because it, of course, takes the power out of that system and puts it in the community. Not by individuals. There's lots of people working in the system who absolutely agree and want to see those kinds of pushes, but they're often powerless to do that unless there's a, a push uh, in terms of politics. And that's, that's one of the main reasons that when I was approached by the group of Indigenous women who asked me to consider having my name put forward for the Senate, it's a huge, I take it very seriously. I now have to work with every fiber of my being to try and change that. No. <clears throat> So I want to move us, before we go to sort of an open Q&A, I want to move us to, to talking a little bit about supports. It's hard to do all that in an hour. It's hard to give a picture of what life is like in prison. Um, it really is. Uh, so I'll ask, I want to ask Tanya you this question, and Odile, I want to ask you this question. We're talking about supports. Tanya, you talked about elders who came in your way. Adelia, you talked about being grateful for things that helped you get out. But give us, Tanya, I'll start with you. Can you just give us a brief picture as if someone had never been into that system? We're talking about the system, but I don't know if we even get it. What, that, what a day would look like. Maybe it's a day that you did have an elder cross your path. What did it look like? What was going on around you? How easy was it? And how did it make you feel? Well, there's certain, um, what kind of day are you asking? A day in the maximum security or a day in a minimum security? Maybe or give a, me both. Or a day, okay. Give me both, because so, they're different. That's, yeah, yeah. They, they sure are. So right. a day in a maximum security. So, I'll give you two maximum securities. So the first one I went to was um, a unit called Federally Sentenced Women. And it was the only maximum security in Canada for women. And we were housed in Prince Albert at the PA Pen for Men. And it was one little unit. And it was actually the men's old psych ward unit. And they moved all the men out and they put up some nice peachy colored paint and painted the bars black and try to make it. And so a day in the maximum security in PA Pen, there was less than 12 of us women in there and there was four cells on each range. And so you have your sink in the corner, you have your toilet bolted down, you have your, exactly how it is in the movies. That's your cell. And the guards are in guard uniform. And you get up your door, the bars, it's a click. And I know that me and Odie will never ever forget this sound. And I know today that I have 
PTSD from it because when I go to the hospital and I hear that, that electric door slam, I get such an ugly feeling in my belly because it brings me back. So you hear this click and it opens, your, your bars come open. And then we get on that range for about an hour. When we get on the range, when our doors click, our trays of food that are plastic wrapped and our juice is plastic. So I don't know how they do it, but there's a, they're, they're bags of juice and they, with a heat presser, I think, and it's on, and this is our tray, and it gets brought from the men from the kitchen. And it's cold, and it's mush, and it's no anything healthy in there. Um, and we don't know what's in our food because the men prepare it. And as some of you know, Saskatchewan Penitentiary is one of the highest for sex offenders, for men. And so they, they're preparing our food and we don't have anything else to eat, so we're trusting that our food is not tampered with. And so that's the first thing when we wake up. And so we're on the range for about an hour and then they say, they come to the barrier and they say, okay, lock up, we need to do a round. So we go back into our cells, clink, the barrier opens, the guard comes and bangs his baton on our cells, and he walks, clink, our doors come open again, clink, and we're on the range for another hour. And then lunch comes, lock up, lunch is here, another tray. And then that's how the day goes until supper time. We lock up, clink, the door comes open, our food. We get another hour outside of our cells. Sometimes if we're lucky, if the guards are feeling good that day, they'll let us go outside in this 20 feet by, I don't know, 12 feet yard that has a fence with barbed wire inside the walls of the penitentiary. So there's a guard tower right here. There's men watching us. And that's if we're lucky, if the guards are feeling that we deserve yard time that day. After that's done, we go back to our cells. The bars open, clink, clink. And then it's lights out. And we go in, lock up. The bar shut again, clink, the guard comes in, bangs his baton on ourselves. And that's, that's a day in the maximum security. I'm not sugarcoating anything, I lived it. You can hear it in my voice. That's what I lived. That was for every single one of us women in there. A day in the new max, when they built the new max in Edmonton Institution for Women, I'll never forget the address, 11151 178th Street, Edmonton, Alberta, T5S2H9. I'll never forget that address. As long as I live, I'll never forget it. I lived there. I thought I was going to die in there. We get up in the morning. Guards are still in their suit. They, they, uh, there's three ranges, and they call them north, east, south. Pods, they made a fancy new name, they call them pods. So there's five cells in each pod and there's a bubble and there's a, a, big, a big area and the guards sit in a bubble and it's all bulletproof, in plexiglass this thick and they have all their buttons to open the doors. Fancy new name, new maximum, still the same feeling. You get up, clink, the door opens, shut our doors, come out. Our food is still coming on the tray, but this time they have a little kitchen. They hired um, a cook from general population, a woman cook, 
comes and cooks our food. We're still getting it on trays. Same, same lunchtime, lock up, food's here. They're feeling good that day, we might get a little yard time. New place, fancy new names, still the same, same feeling. And that's a day in a maximum security. Sometimes we're locked up for the whole day because one of our sisters is going through a rough time and she self-harms. And then we see the tactical. They don't bring in the healthcare people first. They bring in, we call them the goon squad. They bring in the goon squad for safety. And it does something to you when you see your fellow sister being dragged by her arm, bleeding, and they're trying to get her to the, to the, where the bubble is. It does something to you and it lives with you. And you think, how can this happen? Do we deserve this? That dehuman feeling, it's very powerful and it never leaves you. And some way, somehow, you got to dig deep and you got to put one foot in front of the other because you just, you have to feel that there's a better life, that you can make it out. And one day you, you, you do make it out and you get out to general population. And, um, and you think you, you've made it because you get out to general population and you get to live in a house with nine other women. You live in a house with nine other women that have mental health issues, that have addiction issues that are not even starting on their path of healing yet. But you, and you gotta dig deep inside because you're a lifer and you wanna make it out one day. So you go in and you get into your own bubble. You get up, you go to work, you get a job in prison, you come home, you stay inside because you don't wanna mess around or get into any fights with the women that are coming in doing two years, three years, you're there for 20 years, you're there for 30 years. They're going home. And so every day, that's your life. And then you just, us, Odelia, myself, a couple other lifers, we dig deep and we just keep putting one foot in front of the other to hopefully one day be out here in this world and not just come out here and be like, okay, I'm done. I'm out here for a purpose, for a reason, because there are sisters that are back inside still suffering and that are gonna die in there. And if I can't be their voice, if I can't give back to my community and help high-risk youth, help that little Tanya, then why am I even here? I took away from my community when I committed my crime. I took away from my people. And in our way, we have to give back to forgive ourselves. And that's why I'm here today. I don't know any of you. I see my brother, <laughs> I'm so proud that he's here. but that's why I'm here. I'm not here for all this glamour and all this stuff. I'm here because it happened to me, it happened to Odelia. It's happening still. And if we're opening your eyes to what's going on and what they're going through and have those conversations and you guys can ask what you can do, we, 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 have, we have suggestions, absolutely we do. You know, but uh, sorry to go off topic, but no, you're it's a day exactly in life. on topic. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.
You're exactly on topic. <laughs> so, uh, Vidili, I'm going to ask you uh, a similar question, and then I want to talk to talk about what what do we do? What can we do? What does it look like if it's different? But before I do that, one last question. So, Adelia, um, so looking back, and it's not that long ago, some ways, uh, but long ago in lots of other ways, is there something that you think in terms of supports that would have helped you if you had access to it? And it might be a real, this is a simple question, but for many, this might not be, right? What, what could have helped you? What could have helped your fellow sisters, the other people in there with you? Um, what could have helped me and my fellow sisters are proper, how would you say that? How do you say that? Representations. Excuse my broken in English. Yep. Uh, represents legal. Because I see even now that, you know, um, like me, better people to help with lawyers and stuff. Not that a lawyer is not just going to, I don't know. I have uh, a really good lawyer right now. His name's James. So I, don't know, I hope he can help a lot of people. And I'm kind of, excuse me, I'm sorry. My mind's just with Tanya right now. Okay. And thank you for sharing and proud of you. And you know what? Support is means to me is even having uh, like Tanya, another person helping you, like this book, right? It's supposed to help you. That's how I've learned from another fellow, uh, I don't want to call it inmate, sister, a friend helped me get like proper, like understanding your rights with um, coming into the system and learning what not to sign and not to feel threatened you know, like scared to be thrown in max, but you know what, everybody has rights and they don't know that. So I think at the beginning when hopefully, you know, you know that'll s slow down a population with uh, indigenous women going to prison though, but more education with the human rights and the action once they get to the system. Or call Kim, or Kim. That's all I gotta say right now, thank you. Thanks Adelia. And I think that, uh, that <laughs> you're getting claps. Uh, and when you talked about your lawyer, I think you're talking about James Locklear, of Innocence Canada. Um, there are a lot of people that I know that, that he works with, and there's a lot of, uh, yeah. So that's just a shout out to him, so. Um, so I'm giving. <laughs> right? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Letting people know so they know who's who's out there because I want to talk a little bit about what is happening in terms of justice. Um, but we want to talk a bit about reform. And so, Elder Robert, I'm looking at you, um, maybe to give us a little bit of uh, a bit of a picture. When we think about indigenous ways of, of knowing and being, what, what does that look like when we think about corrections? You know, what we call corrections and restoring justice for people. And are those things that you brought in your work when you were working with prisoners? Well, uh... There's uh, several programs um, in Canada <clears throat> that are very successful. And um, I've been invited to, to the ones in Kenora that have the uh, restorative justice uh, <clears throat> program. And these operate outside uh, the, the system. They op operate outside the uh, the uh, the court system, and we have circles of of these inmates, especially uh, the younger uh, the younger generation is is what they're uh, is what they're helping, and out of forty three young students that have um, 
broken the law in one way or another, <clears throat> all 43 of them went back to school, except for one that have re-offended, re but still went back to school. These circles are done in the control of, of the elders and the, and the resource people and the leadership. Yes, the judges are there. The, uh, the lawyers are there watching and witnessing these, these uh, programs. So there's very uh, <clears throat> successful um, programs that operate within indigenous ways of doing things, indigenous ways of helping, ways of counseling, applying therapy in their own indigenous ways of res restoring the, uh, the, the balance within these individuals. And they, and they are being restored to a, a healthy level by, by the use of our, of our language, of our traditions, of our culture, and, uh, and, uh, and getting connected to, the, uh, to, their, uh, to their inner selves, to the, to the culture, with the, with the help of the elders and medicine people and knowledge keepers. So those, <clears throat> what I think is, is restoring the balance with, within, these, within these individuals. That's what I see working, and that's what we need more of. We need more of the supports. We need more of your help to, to get in touch with your uh, members of parliament or, or the decision makers in governments, whether it's municipal, provincial, or federal, to, to speak to them that, that these ways that we do things of helping our, our youth, our young people, young women, young men that are inside to, for them to, to restore their, their balance, to restore their identity, to restore their language, to restore their connection to the land and the waters and the air, to, to help them achieve that. We need more help. We need more supports. We need more funding. We need more of this so that these things can work. And so that's what I see. Uh, that <coughs> that's what the picture to me it looks like. Okay. Thank you. So let's turn to some questions. Uh, see if we can get uh, our lovely audience involved in in the conversation a little bit. So there are uh, two mics. I am so blinded, I can't see. I think there's one back there, Chandra's waving. Uh, and there's one on this side of the room as well. So if you have a question, you can just um, put your hand up if you're able or otherwise signal and they'll come and bring you the microphone. Um, we've got a question that came in through Slido and the question directed to you, Kim, is uh, can you tell us a little bit about the impact of non-disclosure agreements? You know, how are they used and what does that even mean yeah, yeah. if we don't understand that? And um, how might they impact us actually trying to make some systemic change? So um, non-disclosure agreement in a corrections context is usually a situation where someone is bringing a lawsuit against corrections for wrongdoing do done to them, individual or usually individual as opposed to systemic. And in almost all cases when, when the corrections lawyers see the evidence and realize there's a strong case against corrections, they know that the person, the, the person who's in prison in most cases doesn't have a lot of resources and they'll often un offer a cash settlement. But in order to get that cash settlement, and you can imagine if you're in the situation of no supports in the community, about to get a, many people agree to sign a non-disclosure agreement, which means you never hear, I, I, sometimes I hear about them, but that's because uh, in some cases we've managed to put in provisions for men and women where they've indicated that they can consult with someone to get advice about what to do with the money. 
Um, but otherwise, there's a non-disclosure agreement, and you never hear about it. You never hear that it's happened. And the last, under the previous government, and some of what uh, you were alluding to um, in terms of what happened, is in one, in one case, there was a, a piece of legislation that was introduced to try and stop prisoners ever being able to even sue corrections. And all that was produced was a summary of how much money had been paid out to prisoners. No description of what had happened. No identification that the only reason you were only hearing one side of the story was because of these non-disclosure agreements, but a huge issue, obviously. And so now there have been some systemic issues. And, you know, you touched on lawyers. I mean, one of the things that lawyers need to do is better understand these issues by going in. Uh, it's great that the University of Manitoba is about to start a prison law clinic going into Stony. Shout out to them, that's great. Um, but m oftentimes what happens is even really, really good criminal lawyers, historically they've mostly been men. They don't understand racism, they don't understand sex, uh, white and men, and they don't often understand those issues. So even though they're excellent criminal lawyers, they may not know to ask the backstory of what was the context? How did you end up where you were when you ended up now being charged with murder? So really good lawyers have actually said things to me like, don't come near this case because it's a real self-defense. Don't talk to me about racism because then people, it'll get mixed up in the issue. Mm -hmm. Even in Odelia's and Nerissa's situation, there was a lack of understanding of what taking responsibility means in the context of an indigenous woman's life, her family, her community. And so, the, you know, sometimes really good lawyers still don't get it, not because they're not intending to, but because they have no ability to understand those issues. And that's another piece that I think is really important um, in that you've spoken about of why it's important to develop these services and resources in community, not wait till people are in prison. Mm -hmm. right. Question over there. Thank you, Miigwish. Uh, my name is uh, Oscar Boloko. I am a former chaplain at Stony Mountain Institution. I'm sitting uh, with Ken, who is my friend and colleague from Manitoba Multi-Faith and Correction. And on my right, it's my beautiful wife, Annie. I am originally from the Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. And I've been here in Canada many years, and I've studied here. After I finished my studies, I am working and I was a chaplain at Stony Mountain Institution. First black, I think. I go back to the uh, topic of tonight about racism. I want to mention that the problem is not what you see, but the problem is what you don't see. The systemic racism in the staffing of people working in the correction and elsewhere. How you can talk to the people, for instance, who are originally from Africa, from the prison, when you don't know even the culture of that culture, of that people. And for those of us who take the privilege or be lucky to work there, you are not seen, you are invisible. I don't work anymore at Stony Mountain, but when I was there, I was the mentor, instructor, and helper, the one who today, if there is a, an indigenous chaplain at Stony Mountain, he was taught by me. I trained him, so I can be proud of that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, 
We'll take a question maybe on the right here. Yeah, Hi. in the back. Uh, my name's Kirsten. Uh, I'm a librarian. Thank you so much, Tanya and Odelia, for, for sharing your stories. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Pate and, and uh, Elder Green as well. Um, I just wanted to um, talk about uh, the Manitoba Library Association. And for 15 years, we've been going into provincial institutions uh, bringing in books because the provincial institutions do not have libraries. And I think, um, Senator Pate, you were talking about how some people's vision of prisons as being sort of like Shawshank Redemption or Orange is the New Black, but where people are getting books, um, something as simple as just getting books, and that's not happening in the provincial institutions. Um, so the Manitoba Library Association is going in, all volunteers, all donated books. And um, this is something that I think needs to be funded. <laughs> and, and it's something so simple. Um, and um, I guess what I'm saying, I know part of the, 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 uh, the title today is how we can make change is uh, folks could join us, uh, join the Manitoba Library Association. We can definitely use volunteers. Chancellor Mann is here. She does uh, the book club um, uh, at, at women's. Um, and we go in, we, we just bring in books. We, I had this image at first when I first started this 20 years ago at the Edmonton Institution for Women that books were this real rehabilitative tool. But now I see the work that we do is just being perhaps just a humanizing moment, just creating that one moment between us and another human being. Perhaps we'll be talking about a book, perhaps we'll be um, sharing an another story, but um, we could use help, we could use volunteers. Um, the, the provincial prisons do not have funding or even prisons, uh, uh, libraries. So, and I think it's just one tiny little thing that we can do to make a change. We've started a Joe Big George um, collection of indigenous materials that will be going into every prison in the province. Joe Big George was an elder at Milner Ridge. He died in April, and so he and um, his, uh, his partner and, and our organization are building an indigenous collection in all uh, prison libraries. So please, join us if you're able to, Manitoba Library Association. Great. Thank you. I'll take a Slido question, and then there's a question up here. Um, so I'll ask you this one, Odelia, and then I'll see if Tanya has anything to add. Um, there's a lot of young people in the room today with us. They're criminal justice students, they're social work students, they're just young people who've come because they're interested in this topic. I'm glad you're here. What do we tell the next generation about um, like, what do we tell them? They're the ones who are going to help build this system, a new one, reimagine it. What do we want to tell young people about what they need to do? I think we all need to hear it, so I don't want to just make it about the young people, but, you know. Uh, one thing I would like to is about respect. Respect your mother, respect your elders, grandparents, about respect because I think uh, in this day and age, kids are lacking the respect and um, the children again, like there's children are not being able to be children and with all this going, better education in schools about it and like, I know, like I have uh, twin teenage daughters that are 16, and it's not it's not hard, it's not easy, but you know what? I teach my my children to respect no matter what because you don't know what that person's been going through. My children been seeing me since they've been babies in prison, 
And my daughter is going to be 25. And she, her as well, was also lived with me in prison. But, you know, I just want to teach my, this generation, like, honesty about what's going on, about the education, you know. It's about, like, education and honesty between a parent. Because I honestly believe I tell my children today, just no matter what you're going through, you can tell me. Are no secret, you know. It's just about well, getting back to uh, our ways, mm-hmm. our culture. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to add any? Thank you, Adelia. Do you want to add anything, Tanya? Oh, where do I start? I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so, what I would like to say to the young generation that's going into the justice system and. Um, You are going to be our voice. You have a very important role. You are going to be there for people that are really broken. And they're going to count on you. They're going to need your support. And so when you're going into this field, and you're going to start learning about the justice system and going into prisons or being a lawyer or being a judge and making those really hard decisions. Do it with an open heart. They're human beings. Everybody has a story. And so you're going to be that support for a lot of people that can help themselves, that are lost. I was once lost. I was very, very lost. And I can stand here today and be proud of who I am and what I'm doing today. But it just didn't happen overnight. It took 20 years. And I know when I say that, sometimes it feels so unreal. I did 20 years in prison. You know, so you're going to be, you're going to meet a lot of people. So go in with an open heart. And I always say this to students that are taking law when I go to universities. If you're going to be an a-hole, be an a-hole. If you're going to be nice, be nice. Don't be (laughs) flip-floppy. Oh, sorry. (laughs) But you know what I mean? Like, don't... (laughs) Don't advice. don't be. <laughs> no, be, we don't want. To do <laughs> just, I'm really clear. Just be <laughs> that one. Like, be one side. If you're gonna be hard, then be hard. If you're gonna be soft and caring, be soft and caring. Because it does something to us, and our walls are always up because we don't know who we're getting that day. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I think we're all electing to go one way, um, <laughs> the choices you gave us. Um, I'm going to ask a question that might be in some, uh, some people's minds. It's a question I've heard asked uh, before. So it's a little bit of a crass kind of question. I'm going to ask you to answer, Kim. What do you, what do you say to people who um, their natural inclination is to say that We've got systems of behavior. People do bad things. We've got to put them somewhere. They've got to know the consequences of their actions. Mm-hmm. That's what prison is for. And so when they have... So prison is for them to go and repent and reform. And when they come out, they, then we welcome them back in. And we've got all the system you know, supports ready for that. Mm-hmm. Like that just very simplistic view of that's what prison is for. So why are we even having this conversation? Yeah, it's not just simplistic. It's what a lot of people believe. Um, And so, you know, I grew up a working class kid. I actually, uh, I would have been characterized as being pretty law and order as a, because that's how I was raised. You know, you do the crime, you do the time. Then I started going into, well, I went to law school and I learned, oh, we have laws and the law applies equally to everyone. Oh, but... If you're poor, 
if you're racialized, if you're more likely to end up in prison. So when I first went into prison, believe it or not, the most, uh, the thing I was most surprised about, there weren't a lot of rich people in there. And I knew a lot of rich people who did some pretty <laughs> awful things. And, you know, and so the people who caused the harm aren't, it's not who causes the greatest harm that necessarily gets locked up. And so if, if you want a fair system, then we have to create that kind of fairness in community. And if we don't have a fair system in community, then prisons are the microcosm of everything that fails. You know, I said every system that fails, but it's also it, the intersections become greater and the, the consequences become much, much more harsh. And so if you go into a prison, you don't see a lot of rich people. You see very few, in fact. If you go into prison, you see a lot of people who are racialized. You see a lot of people who have had challenges. We've chronicled the, you know, the layers upon layers of how this, this builds in injustice. So are we saying, or am I saying, I'll speak for myself only, do I think we should hold people accountable? Absolutely. I made myself go in and work with male sex offenders because I had my own personal biases about that because of all kinds of, you can imagine, experiences that women have and girls have. And th when I did that, what it was shocking to me was it was almost black and brown men. And part of why I stopped doing the work is it was being reinforced by the very people, not just in corrections, but in the community groups that I was working with, who worked with those men, the, the biased, macho attitudes were being reinforced in every part of the system. And that's what made me leave actually working with men and focus on women, because I thought, okay, I don't know how to deal with that. And I have often said, if we had 20 good men who could model the behavior we want to see men portray with one man who's in prison, I would be willing to say, you take that guy, you model it, and let's see how that works out, because it's got to work out better than what we're doing right now. And so it's not about not holding people to account, but it's also about holding ourselves to account, to actually walk our talk and not just say we believe in fairness and equity and justice, but to actually put those measures in place so that people experience it and not just leave those who have the least to bear the brunt of the failures of all those systems. And that's what we do now. So it's not about not supporting people. Right now, if you've been victimized, the only thing you're offered really is law and order. You may get offered, a, and no offense to anybody, a restorative approach, but that's almost always on the back of the victim. It's not going to be something that is about really fixing some of these issues in the ways that we need to address them. It's not about economic equality. It's not about racial equality. It's not about gender equality. And we have to come face to face with that, that our systems reinforce all of those attitudes. Um, and particularly when we're talking about women, the very systems themselves build on that discrimination and, and tell women there, you know, most of us grew up knowing it's partially our responsibility if we walk in the wrong place, wear the wrong clothes, hang out with the wrong people. We don't say to men, you need to be, have other men be able to vouch for you, and in particular women in your lives to be able to vouch for you to keep walking around freely in this society. And so I think we have to really interrogate how we, how we characterize that harm and who we're protecting ourselves from. Because if, if we're saying that we lock up the most dangerous people, then we're locking up poor, indigenous, and other racialized women who have a history of sexual abuse and physical abuse and are dealing with PTSD around that and maybe anesthetizing themselves with drugs and alcohol, and that supposes the greatest risk to our society. I'd be surprised if there's a person in this room who believes that, but that's who we're locking up most. Let me take a question from the left side of the room. Uh, Sorry, did I answer? Did no, I answer? What you, you did answer okay. the question. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Hello? My name is uh, Chris, Chris Classio. Uh, I've been working with urban indigenous young people of the North End for seven years. And many of the teachings that I received working with urban indigenous young people is concepts like the good life or wakotoin. 
which is a Cree word for kinship. Uh, we hear politicians use words like harm reduction and uh, restorative justice, but what do those words actually mean if non-Indigenous people like myself, who I feel like Indigenous knowledge has also saved my life, not just Indigenous peoples. And so if politicians really understood what it meant to understand Indigenous knowledge, how would this system change for, not, for us non-Indigenous uh, individuals to be that the foothold that supports our communities. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to answer that. Um, I'm going to ask Elder Robert. Do you want to try take that and then yeah, Tanya? Yeah. I think um, as Indigenous peoples. We need to believe, or we must believe, that we can change our current circumstances, these situations that, that we have been placed in. We need to believe in something, even if it's in yourself, the Creator, the higher power, whomever you have faith and believe in. As indigenous peoples, we have not yet have had the opportunity or the time to, to start believing in ourselves that we can change our current circumstances. That is what we need to believe in. And as young people, we need to inspire them that there is hope that there is change that is going to be happening because of what is happening here today, of these great minds coming together in this room, that we can create that change that, it, that, that is needed most dearly within our communities. Awesome. Yeah, I, the change that, uh, all of a sudden, I got really loud. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I truly believe in giving back, giving back to my community, our people, the youth, because it's so true, like our youth are our future. And I have a nine-year-old son, and I have a 19-year-old son, and a 27-year-old and a grandson. And it was very hard because to my older sons, I, I wasn't a mother to them. I was in prison for their whole life. And um, today, I have a really good relationship with two of my sons. My older son is very angry at me, and he's into addiction. And um, I had to... I had to cut my older son off because there was only so many times I could tell him I was sorry and I was living a good life and I'm doing the, the best that I can. And as a mother, it's one of the hardest things when your child is in full addiction. And then I have to remember I have two other sons who are doing really good in life and that we're breaking cycles. My mom raised my 19-year-old uh, and today he works for the RCMP up in the Paw. And my other son is nine and he's involved with sports. He does two sports a week, hockey, football, soccer. He's never known to come home to a house with no food in the cupboards, to come home to drunken parents. He's never known that. He's never known me to raise my voice and argue with my partner, my wife, who I've been with for 13 years. We actually met in the prison. And, and so when I got out, 
I was like, I know what I want to do, but I don't know how to get there. I know I want to work with high-risk people. I know, but no organization would hire me in Winnipeg. And I just kept getting no, no, no. And I was like, I have all this lived experience and I have all this training. Just give me a chance. You can always fire me. <laughs> you know? So true. <laughs> But no, nobody wanted to give me a chance, and I was like, okay, and, um, and I got that chance two years ago. I got a call, and I went for my interview, mm. and I got hired on the spot. And today, I'm a manager of a youth healing lodge that works with high-risk youth. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I, I go into NYC, I go and visit the youth. The first time I had a full circle moment in my life, I took one of the youth to a probation appointment. And I remember I was sitting there and this youth was having their probation appointment and I, I had to get up and leave because the tears just started coming down and I could see little Tanya having a probation appointment. And I said to myself, I was like, I'm going to do whatever I have to do for this youth to have unconditional love. That they're going to know that their safe person is me, Tanya. And that's the love I give to these youth today. Mm -hmm. They know. They call me Auntie Big Deal. Because <laughs> the, the youth, the boys, they're like, you just think you're a big deal, don't you? <laughs> But, you know, like I made that connection with them and they know that I'm real. I don't think I'm better than anybody else. I tell them that I, I've been in prison for 20 years and I changed my life. And I'm an open book, you know. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. But I, I, I don't stay stuck. I keep going. And that's... Wakoda win, mm -hmm. I live by that. You know, to give back. Today, I know my community is proud of me. I know my family is proud of me. It took so many decades for, for that to happen. But today, I know I can get up and I'll be like, I'm living a good life. I'm going to work eight to four. Whoever thought I'd be making what I'm making today. And I get to get up eight to four. I made five bucks a day for 20 years. <laughs> it comes out to $52 every 10 days. <laughs> but you know, and, and I humble myself all the time. I always, and I'm sure Odelia does too, like we go back and we think about the time we were in prison and, and we can laugh and, and be like the hardest day out here on the outside world will never match the hardest day when I was in prison. And if I could get through that day and my sisters can get through that day, then we can get, can make it out here. So with that, thank you. So we have had so many questions through the Slido app, but our time is coming to an end. So, um, Take one last question, and uh, then super short, just uh, wrap up. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Um, Independent Senator for Manitoba, Mary Lou McFedrin, and my question is about elders. Um, Elder Green, I've been very fortunate through uh, my sister, Senator Kim, to be with her in a number of prisons in Canada, and consistently what we heard from Odelia and Tanya today about the importance of elders is what we've also heard as senators going, as Kim says, going to prison. And my question is about barriers, because we heard about the importance and we heard about how difficult it often was to actually, for the elders, to navigate the system in order to be fully available. And I'd like to know um, if there's more that needs to be done, and if so, what that is, to remove any barriers that may be there systemically um, so that 
elders can in fact have full and regular access um, to be with prisoners since we have clearly heard how important that is. Thank you very much. Most of, <coughs> most of that work needs to be done with, within the systems, um, knowing the, uh, the superintendents, the, uh, the correction officers, and uh, to, to, to begin to change the policies within the system because that's where a lot of the, the change needs to happen as well as the, the provincial level as well and the federal level where uh, elders can have more access and also to be recognized as uh, not only just as healers but to be recognized as psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, counselors. There's very little recognition on that in the, in, in the work that, that elders do within, within the correction systems. And there's need to be more um, openness with uh, how we talk and communicate with elders. And again, like what, uh, what Tali said, that uh, you need to find the real elders the genuine elders, the good elders that, that, do, do, that do that good work. The, unfortunately, there's a lot of them that, that go in there and just uh, exacerbate the, the inmates themselves, that they don't uh, help, really help at all. <clears throat> That's the other thing that you need to consider, is that who are these elders? Who's qualified to be an elder? That for me, I was uh, I was given a bundle to to carry, and uh, I didn't want to take it at first because I knew the the work that it, it needed to do. So uh, reluctantly, I accepted it, and then within within almost a year, the the leadership and the community of Skatezai, uh, number 39, uh, started to recognize me as an elder. So those kind of elders that you need to seek has to be sanctioned and ratified by the community that they come from, that they represent. Because the, these elders are, uh, have a good track record that, that, they, that they, they do that good work in the communities and outside the communities as well. So you need to find those ones and to begin to change the, the policies and the regulations within corrections to allow more access of, of these elders within the system. And that way real change can, can happen in, inside that help these young women and these young men in that system to come out and stay out. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Elder Robert. Um, so our time is coming, come to an end. Uh, so a couple of things that I'm thinking about. I know you're thinking about who you're going to talk to about this, what we talked about tonight. Um, what you may be thinking about is, well, did we reimagine the system? Did we talk about making prisons better? Did we talk about getting rid of prisons? And if we talked about getting rid of prisons, what was the alternative presented? And I don't know that we had that conversation, but if that's what you're thinking about, then I think we've got this far in the conversation. And it means that by just the fact that all of you are here tonight in the numbers that you are, that there are more conversations like this to have and I hope that some of them will be here in this place at the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. Um, I've been thinking a lot lately about how it is something very special when people fight to improve a system that has been designed to hold them down. And Tanya, Odelia, thank you. Thank you for sharing your stories, parts of them, with us. It was never our intention to, to bring you here to say, tell us everything, tell us your whole life. 
it was just to give us a glimpse into what you're thinking about and what you think we should be thinking about. And so thank you for doing that with such honesty. Kim, Senator Pate, thank you. Thank you for the immense work that you do, have done, continue to do with your colleagues, with all those that you work with. And I have to say, just even in preparing for this evening, seeing the connection that you have with these two women who've joined us this evening, with Renee, who wasn't able to be with us, but whose poem has been circling through those slides. Um, I think you embody what we're talking about, which is if we truly believe that all human beings are born equal in dignity and rights, we will live those rights in how we interact with people. So thank you. And Elder Robert, thank you, thank you. for sharing your experience, your knowledge, and for grounding us in this conversation in the way that you always do. So thank you, everyone, for being here. And thank you. Nice and thank, thank you. you. <laughs> That's good.